Christ our King, King of kings and Lord of lords, and may the strength of the Lord be in his people tonight. Amen. We're continuing our sermon series in Galatians chapter 5. We're looking at the works of the flesh, that we not walk in them, and walking by the Spirit. And the next one we're going to look at tonight is sorcery. So let's take a look at that in Galatians chapter 5 as we begin. Paul says in verse 16 and following, But I say, walk by the Spirit, that is, by the Holy Spirit, and do not gratify the, desire, the desires of the flesh. In other words, our old sinful nature. For the desires of the flesh, our old sinful nature, are against the Spirit, that is, the Holy Spirit. And the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to prevent you from doing what you would. In other words, the Holy Spirit... And our flesh, our sinful natures, are at war with each other. But if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Then Paul says in verse 19, Now the works of the flesh are plain. Fornication, impurity, licentiousness, idolatry. We've already looked at those in the previous weeks. Next, next word, sorcery. That's one of the works of the flesh. And that's what I'd like to talk with you about tonight. That we not walk in the ways of the flesh. Sorcery but according to the Spirit, in the good, clean way of God and Christ. So, let's talk about sorcery. What does God want us to know about sorcery tonight by His Scriptures? Well, first of all, what is sorcery? Now, I could do this off the top of my head, but I wrote it down because I thought it would be helpful to put my thoughts and description, definition here, get the whole thing in here. Sorcery is connecting to spiritual realms in ways that are not of God, not authorized by Him. Ungodly ways. It's seeking to connect with spiritual power or powers. To gain insight in spiritual things, but not by the means that God has given to us, namely His Word and prayer, etc., but by divination trying to contact, conjure up spirits, gain insight and power in spiritual realms in ways that are not of God, connecting with such. It's witchcraft, magic, necromancy. You know, what is necromancy? It comes from a, a Greek word, it's like necros, which means death. It is contacting the dead, ever trying to contact Bring up the dead and speak with them. That is necromancy. It's part of witchcraft and sorcery. It's conjuring up spirits. Delving into the spiritual unseen realms, but in an ungodly way. It's seeking to have familiar spirits. What is that? You ever hear of a familiar spirit? That is like spirit guides. You ever hear of people saying, I'm seeking spirit guides, which are spirits that attend to you personally, that you know and you have like a daily contact with to gain insight? This is a familiar spirit. It's sorcery. It's casting spells, divining by secret arts, incantations, and other such ungodly things. And there's more, but there's a general definition of sorcery. So what we're talking about tonight is not just Mr. Mag Magician by sleight of hand, you know, going over to Alice and pulling a corner out from behind her ear, or, you know, an egg out from behind the ear over here, or a rabbit out of a hat. We're talking about real spiritual power and spiritual places, but not as God would have us go after these things. So, does God address sorcery in Scripture? You tell me, yes or no? Yes, yes He does. Now, what's He say to us about it? Answer, He categorically condemns sorcery as evil and an abomination in His sight. So, what does God want us to do about sorcery or with sorcery? The answer is steer clear of it. Don't have anything to do with it. Rather be blameless before their Lord your God and walk in cleanliness. Walk by the Spirit and not in this work of the flesh, which is sorcery and witchcraft and magic and such things. Now, uh, was sorcery around in ancient days, do you think? Can we find it in Scripture? Well, let's take a look at a passage here when Moses, remember, he went to Pharaoh to get God's people out of Egypt. We read here in uh, Exodus 7 um, that Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh. 
did as the Lord commanded. Aaron cast down his rod. Remember Moses' staff? And it became a serpent. That is the work of God. But we read, then Pharaoh summoned the wise men and the sorcerers, and they also, the magicians of Egypt, did the same by their secret arts. For every man cast down his rod, and they became snakes. So, this is power, isn't it? We're talking about real power, and the scripture says that they were able to do the same by their secret arts. Of course, they're not going to be able to follow God very long with these miracles, believe me. We'll talk about that more later. But they were able to do these things, and that's pretty powerful. Here's another one. Let's look over at 1 Samuel chapter 28. Remember King Saul? When he did wrong and evil before the Lord, and God took away his spirit, and we, the Holy Spirit from him. When Saul saw the army of the Philistines, he was afraid, and his heart trembled greatly. When Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord didn't answer him, either by dreams, or by Urim, or by the prophets. Then Saul said to his servants, Seek out for me a woman who's a medium. Now what's a medium? A witch. Someone who's going to go in between, in the middle, in the medium, between this world and the unseen spiritual world. Seek out a medium, a witch, that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servant said to him, Behold, there is a medium at Endor. So Saul disguised himself and put on other garments and went, he and two other men with him, and they came to the woman by night. And he said, Divine from me by a spirit, and bring up for me whomever I shall name to you. The woman said, Surely you know what King Saul has done, how he's cut off the mediums and wizards from the land. You're laying a snare for my life to bring about my death. In other words, if I do this, he'll kill me. doesn't know it's Saul. Saul swore to her, as the Lord lives, no punishment shall come upon you. She says, whom shall I bring up for you? He said, bring up for me Samuel. When the woman saw Samuel, you know, in her seance, and her bringing up Samuel, it says, she cried out with a loud voice, and the woman said to Saul, why have you deceived me? You are Saul, King Saul. So how did she know this? Spiritual insight, spiritual knowledge through wrong avenues, she was reaching into the spiritual realm. Even though Saul's disguised, she was able to see right through his costume and say, you are the king. She knew it. So, so uh, up he comes, Samuel comes, and really, should King Saul have done this? Number one, it's evil. Number two, it wasn't a good message. Samuel comes up from the dead, and he basically says, King Saul, God has forsaken you because you've forsaken him. And tomorrow, this is the message. You shall be with me where I am and all your sons. That's the punishment. He was to die the next day. Not good calling up on witches, amen? Amen. Don't go doing this, God says. Look over here at Deuteronomy um, chapter 18. All of the promised land, it was filled with this kind of wizardry in the days before Joshua comes in and takes it over. God says, you know, when you come in there, there should not be a map found among you. Anyone who burns a son or his daughter as an offering, you know, to a demon or a false god. No one, there should not be no one who practices divination, a soothsayer, an auger, a sorcerer, a charmer, or a medium, or a wizard, or a necromancer. For whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord. Because of the abominable practices, of these abominable practices, the Lord your God is driving them out before you. For these nations which you're about to dispossess, give heed to soothsayers, to diviners. But as for you, the Lord God, your God has not allowed you so to do. You should be blameless before the Lord. So, was there sorcery, wizardry, witchcraft in the land of the promised land before Israel got there? Yes, it was chock full of it. All over the place. And what happened when Israel got there? They did the same thing. They fell into all the same magic practices. So, it was in ancient days. How about in Jesus' days, in the biblical days of the apostles? Was there magic around? Wizards? Witches? What do you think? Well, we just read here over in Acts chapter 13, Paul ran into a magician. Elimus was his name in Acts 13. And the guy was hindering the word of the preaching of, of Jesus Christ. And Paul eventually got angry. And uh, he says, you're a son of the devil, and you're making crooked the straight paths of the Lord, you shall be blind for a time. And mist came over his eyes. And Paul struck the magician. 
Over here we see in Acts chapter 8, in the land of Samaria, there was a man named Simon who had previously practiced magic in the city and amazed the nation of Samaria, saying that he himself was somebody great. This was in the days of Philip the Evangelist who went there. Simon was a magician, which doesn't mean he's like, oh, let's saw a woman in half. I know this isn't this interesting. Or, you know, here's an egg. No, he was practicing magic. If we look over here in Acts chapter 16 also, in Philippi, Paul and his companion were going to preach and evangelize. And we were, he says, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination. What is that? A familiar spirit, a spirit guide. She was contact, contacting a spirit who gave her, you know, through her augury or reading of omens or whatever, information. And she brought her owners much gain by soothsaying. So was it working for her? Yes, making lots of money because the spirit was giving, you know, illegal insider trading information. And they got this spiritually. It really works, but it's evil. And we read there in Acts chapter 19 that when the word of God prevailed mightily amongst the people and they were repenting, what did they do? A lot of those who previously had practiced all kinds of, quote, secret arts, they brought their books that were full of all the incantations and spells and secret things of Satan and they burned them and there was a great bonfire and the cost was, I don't know, very, very expensive of all these books that they burned. That's in Acts chapter 19. Now, that was back then in biblical days, right? And in ancient days, Old Testament and New Testament. I'm so happy that we don't have to deal with any sorcery or magic at all in our days, right? We're totally free of this. Yeah. We know it's all just fake and it's not really real. Well, only it's everywhere and it's real and it's powerful. Can I show you where it is in our society? Let's take a look at that for a second. First of all, when I was in Maine, lived up in Maine, um, I was in a Bible study, went to a home Bible study for a while, and there was a girl who was the daughter of someone who came to our Bible study. She was involved in witchcraft. Spells, incantations, contacting spirits. Very big in Maine amongst the teenagers up there. And we tried witnessing to her, prayed for her for several weeks. Guess what? And I had the honor, by God's grace, to actually be one of the spearheads in leading this girl out of witchcraft into coming to Christ. I, she was right there before my eyes. And with tears, finally she broke down and renounced Satan and all the things she had been practicing and called on Jesus Christ for salvation. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Also, um, it's everywhere in books. For example, who is this? You can see it, right? Harry Potter. What does this say? And the Sorcerer's Stone. Oh, but it's so well written. It's so entertaining. Yeah, but it's the Sorcerer's Stone, right? And what does God say in His Word about this? It's evil and it's an abomination in His sight. Here's a book that I enjoyed some years ago. Lord of the Rings. You ever read that one? I mean, it's so well written. But who's one of the heroes in it? Gandalf the wizard. Remember? And he's up there with Sauron and he, whatever, and he conjures up these spells and boom and all these things. Very exciting story, but again, it's evil and an abomination in God's sight. But our society makes them out to be heroes. There's the older story. If you can see that far. King Arthur and Merlin. It goes way back, and this is a modern day TV show. But who's Merlin? He's a magician. He's a wizard. What does he do? Conjure up spiritual power in ways that are not authorized by God to protect him. And what is he again? A hero to our society. Wrong. Don't go that way. It's evil and abomination. Sorcerers. It's evil. We got to see it for what it is. How about this one? Games. You ever see this game? What is that one? Ouija board. I don't know if anybody ever played one. I would not recommend it. Because guess what? This may be by Mattel or whatever. I don't know who puts it out. But this is no game. This is actually contacting spirits who move your hands around in order to give you secret insider information from spiritual places. That's Audrey. That's divination. This is evil. You know, I had a friend who is a, a fellow student at Concordia Seminary in St. Louis. He told me personally, face to face, he said he once, when he was younger, 
had done a Ouija board with his friends. And he said, I told my friends we shouldn't be doing this, but his friends insisted and he went along with it. He says, while they're in the middle of putting their hand on the board, and he told me this personally, face to face, he says, the board levitated, oh my God. and they were, the ceiling was like 30 feet up, and it shot up to the ceiling and hit the ceiling. And he just basically said, at that point, I just stood up and I rebuked the spirit. It says, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get out of here. And the board came down, and they had nothing to do with Ouija boards anymore. Good. Friends, there's power in these things. Not like God's power, but there is power in these things. Don't touch them. If you have, repent of it. Just get rid of it. How about this one? You ever seen that? You see that far? Magic eight ball. Come on, it's just a little magic eight ball. It's no big deal, but what are you doing? You ask it a question, you shake it up, and it gives you the answer. Again, this is just like a little, the devil's just fishing. He's dropping all kinds of hooks in to try to get the kids interested in this stuff. Don't do it. There's also this one that was popular when I was a kid. Dungeons and Dragons. You ever hear of that? Which a lot of people say are actual real spirits in the, in the game that have been put into a game in order to get the kids into that kind of stuff. And now I'm about to step on people's toes. You ready for that? Raise your hand if you're ready for me to step. Step on toes. I'm going to go this way. What is that? You see that? Oh, magic. Disney's <laughs> what kingdom? Magic. Ma say it again. Magic, magic kingdom. Okay, what does God say about magic? Evil and an abomination. What is it? Yeah, Disney's magic kingdom. Do we need to be on guard against this? You know, who would dare attack Disney? Well, let me just say this. Don't shoot the piano player. I'm just reading the music. Okay? It's evil and abomination of the Lord to pur pur put out their magic. But it's so nice. It's so friendly. It's so family. It's so, so wholesome. But look at this. Who's this guy? Mickey Mouse in what? The Sorcerer's Apprentice. We're talking about sorcery tonight. Getting kids into it. And when I thought about this, you know, I like a lot of the Disney movies they, in terms of they got great sounds, really well drawn, they're exciting, Etc. But as I was thinking about this sorcery thing today, uh, or yes, Monday, I thought about this. Look at all the stories of Disney, other than maybe Swiss Family Robinson. That's the only one I could think of that didn't have magic. Think about this. You with me here? Look, Little Mermaid had the sea witch. Uh, Beauty and the Beast, it was an enchantress that turned him into a beast. By the way, notice also, in ancient veiled religions, it was you know, relationships with half man, half creatures. What is Little Mermaid? Half woman, half fish. Beauty and the Beast, half man, half beast. Romances, shady. How about Sleeping Beauty? Was there a witch in that one? Yes. Yes, there was. How about um, Pocahontas? Let's talk with Grandmother Willow, the willow tree, and get the information from there. How about Aladdin? It was a genie. Look, almost everything that they put out is sorcery. And, you know, it's very interesting to look at this, but God says it's evil and an abomination. You've got to steer clear of it. Or at least if you do see it, teach your children right and wrong about these things through it. Here's one that was really big for me when I was a kid. See that one? What's that? Star Wars. Remember Luke? Oh, I love that scene. I used to, anyway, with Yoda. But what is he out there doing in this, on, this, on this planet? What is he doing? He's learning sorcery from the chief sorcerer, how to levitate stuff. That's sorcery. It was really fun. It seems really nice. He's the hero, but it's sorcery. Then, this is old stuff now, but like Buffy the Vampire Slayer and things like that. So we can go to from TVs and, and stuff like that. But how about this one? What does that say? ACDC. You ever listen? I mean... The rock bands, a lot of rock bands, deal in sorcery. Um, this band I put up here, I even hate to have hold the thing in my hand, but you know what? This band I chose because these guys actually have publicly said out loud that they did make a pact with Satan to get where they were, to do what they did. And you have this guy, Bob Dylan, which I had a little discussion with someone who's no longer at our church uh, about this. Uh, he, on a 60 Minutes episode one time, said, you know, 
the interviewer said, why are you still in, in this after so many years? He says, because I'm keeping up my end of the bargain, said Bob Dylan. And the interviewer at 60 Minutes said, do you mind if I ask who you made that bargain with? And Dylan says, with the commander in unseen places. Well, I had a discussion with someone one time. They were saying, oh, he made a, he made a pact with God. But how many times do you make a pact with God to be a world-famous rock star? And how often do Christians call God the commander in unseen places? He's admitting on 60 Minutes he made a pact with the devil to get where he was. Should we be listening? You know, a lot of these bands, just so you're aware of it, sprinkle all kinds of little incantations and spells into their music to capture people. Then what they do is they put you into a big concert place where they'll flash lights on you in the dark while they're playing a particular beat that puts you into a trance-like state to put you into another state of consciousness. What is this? It's sorcery. We've got to be very careful about these things. I know I'm like blowing everything you're having fun with, right? So what is there left to do? But look, it's evil and an abomination. Let's keep ourselves clean, be blameless before the Lord your God. I'm going to throw out two more here for you. What is this one? Can you see that? Can you see what is that? <laughs> it's drugs, right? Do you know the word that Paul uses for the works of the flesh when he says sorcery in Galatians chapter 5? The word in the Greek is pharmakeia. What is it? Pharmakeia. Does that sound familiar to you? That's a needle. Like, well, I don't know what the drugs are. Pharmaceutical. Pharma C. Pharmakeia. It's the illegal, basic use of drugs to get other states of consciousness. When I was in the Episcopal Church years ago, the um, reason we became Lutherans and left that church was because the guy that came to our church up in Maine, his wife was removing Bible stories from the children in the Sunday school and instead was teaching them how to contact their spirit guides. And we're like, sayonara, see you later. We're out of here. That's when we eventually became Lutherans. So there's all kinds of stuff of sorcery out there in the world. Why? Because people have an inbuilt, I believe, desire and call to go into spiritual places for more spiritual experiences than just this life. But what God put that in us for is to go after Him. Amen? Yes. To know Him, to worship Him, to revel in His Word, to meditate on His Scriptures, to seek the Holy Spirit, to walk in the Holy Spirit, to experience Him. Not to go into trespassing, devious ways of darkness which capture people and bring them into great darkness. Let me ask you a question. Is there real power in this stuff? Or am I just saying, you know, don't do these things because they're just bad things to do. Or is there power? Yeah. Well, look at what happened to Moses. He cast his rod on the, on the ground and the magicians did the same. And what happened? They became serpents. These guys have power. Not like God's, but power. The woman with the spirit of divination in Acts 16 was able to get much money for her owners by soothsaying, you know, playing with a Ouija board. And I just say in my earlier days, I took a class once from a sorcerer when I didn't know it was a sorcerer. I was young, I didn't know which, what the truth was, but I took a class from a Native American guy who would or a shaman guy thinking, well, Jesus did miracles, and so maybe this is how he did it. Maybe I could learn how miracles are done. And I saw this guy, and I was an eyewitness right here. He went out, and we were in the wilderness with a, with a class, and he went down on the ground, and it was totally unbroken earth, out in the middle of nowhere. And he, he goes, with his hand over the ground, and he says, you know, right front deer track, left back fox track. And he took a ruler. And he started to peel away the ground and pulled it back, went down about a foot. And then the ground was very dark and kind of moist, but then the two tracks appeared perfectly, right where he said, right at a, a foot on the ground. And I was three feet away, four feet away. I saw, when I finally saw that he was a sorcerer and later on understood about that, where was I? I'm out of here. <laughs> I'm going, you know, that's not my Lord and his stuff. But this stuff is powerful. So what's God say to us about these things? He says, it's an abomination and evil. It's because the land was full of these things that I sent Joshua in there and the people exterminated the people from the land. 
And that's why God showed no mercy when Joshua came in, because the land was filled with sorcery. And no sorcerers shall inherit the kingdom of heaven. We read this in the Old Testament. Let me give you one example there. Leviticus chapter 20. A man or a woman who is a medium, a wizard or a witch, shall be put to death. They shall be stoned with stones, and their blood shall be upon them. And in the New Testament, in Revelation 22, God says, Blessed are those who wash their robes, that they may have the right to the tree of life, and that they may enter the city by the gates. Outside are the dogs, and the sorcerers, and the fornicators, and murderers, and idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. So what's going to be like if you're a, if you're a sorcerer on the Day of Judgment? You're going to go over there and be banging. Let me in, let me in. And there'll be no entrance. But for you who are Christians, the entrance is beautiful and open. It's called Jesus Christ. So, if you're going to walk by the Spirit and not by the flesh, what is God calling us to in this day? He's saying, I've put into you the desire for spiritual things. But I want you to seek them in those things that I've authorized here. In my word. Meditate on my word. Seek my spirit. Go to me in prayer. Meditate on me. Spend time in my presence. And do you think that there's power? And more power available to you than you've even dreamed of? When Moses went up on the mountain with God and hung out with him, he came down. He didn't even know his face was shining and glowing with the glory and power of God. You know, when I took that class from that shaman guy, you know how you get power in occult and sorcery? You know how? By practicing it. By praying. By focusing. By, mem by meditating. Do you know how you get power as a Christian? By spending time with the Word, with the Lord, in worship, in prayer. And, you know, if you want greater strength, we need to spend more time and not just sit over there on our phones all day, but be in the Lord. God says that the power that has worked in you is the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead and made up to at God's right hand in the heavenly places. There is such power already in you. And as we draw near to God, our faces begin to shine as we behold God and His glory in Jesus Christ. And I'll just tell you this. We're concluding. I know it's been a long, but listen up. The power that's at work in you puts sorcery to shame. It has nothing on you. Because not only does it have no power over you, but when Moses cast his snake and his rod on the ground, it went over there and ate up their snakes, their rods. Paul blinded Elimus, the magician. And when the sorcerers in Moses' day thought that they could imitate Moses, they did for a little bit. But then God just hits the afterburners. Like an F-16 Hornet, or 15, taken off the carry deck, and they're out there playing with paper airplanes. The power that is at work for you in Jesus Christ makes mincemeat and makes all sorcery seem like nothing but kindergarten and less. In fact, it's just plain evil. Jesus says, I've given you authority to tread upon serpents and scorpions. But don't revel in this, that the spirits are subject to you, which they are, but glory in this, that your names are written in heaven. And Jesus Christ has cleansed you. He has washed you of your sins. You are clean people, and God says, now walk in cleanness and seek me in the Spirit. Walk by the Spirit. Draw near. Meditate. Be in my word. Pray. And great power and strength will come upon you. And on the last day, what's it going to look like? You're going to walk straight through open gates into paradise and welcomed as children of the age to come. Glorified and redeemed in Jesus Christ. In His name, Amen.